Let's talk about putting kids in corsets. I'm kidding. <laughs> But seriously, in the early to mid 18th century, it was pretty much expected that a large proportion of children, both boys and girls, would be wearing stays from a really young age, like infancy young age. This advertisement from 1771 says that she offers stays for children as young as three months. So that's, that's pretty young. But Kate, babies in corsets. Stays, not corsets. I just said corsets to upset you. No, they were not trying to reduce the waistline of babies. Honestly, they weren't even really doing this for women, and I really wish people would stop spreading that myth around. Tight lacing in the 18th century? Not really a thing. That comes from the Victorians, and it wasn't even really a thing then either. But that's, that's another video. Just look at this painting and try to tell me that that kid does not have some serious armor under there. Those destined for masculine clothing would usually stop wearing stays from somewhere between three and seven when they transitioned away from gowns and towards more like trouser-like clothing. Those destined for petticoats and gowns were going to wear stays for the rest of their lives. I do want to point out that stays aren't going to be something that a lower income family are going to prioritize, and that kind of goes for enslaved people as well. Although one of my favorite references, Instructions for Cutting Out Apparel for the Poor, is literally an instruction manual for economical clothing manufacture, I can't find any actual references to the children of enslaved people wearing stays. Their mothers frequently did, not all the time, and so I can't say it's impossible, but I also can't prove it. Either way. Anyway, during this time, stays were considered to be quite healthy. They were meant to support the spine and any wibbly-wobbly internal organs, therefore ensuring children would grow up with very excellent posture. Of course, during this same time, there was a sort of renaissance for children. You might have heard before, possibly from me, that children are dressed as tiny adults, which is kind of true. Children were also sort of treated as tiny adults before this period. But beginning around the middle of the 18th century, there was a gradual movement towards more freedom of dress and more freedom in general for the tiniest members of society. In 1762, Rousseau's Emile, or On Education, was published, and although it's not like a 1990s self-help parenting book, it does contain a lot of information and opinions on child rearing, including this quote, everything that cramps and confines nature is in bad taste. I feel like we can all get behind that, right? This wasn't really about stays, but it does sort of sum up how everyone is about to like actually start nurturing their children and letting the kids run a bit wild. It also really explains how everyone transitioned towards the ancient Greece-inspired fashions towards the end of the century because we aren't containing any nature here. Now, this movement towards more freedom of dress does not mean that stays were thrown in the bin immediately. We have advertisements from mantua makers and stay makers in Virginia in the 1770s offering stays for children. The reference I already mentioned, Cutting Out Apparel for the Poor, wasn't published until 1789 as far as I'm aware. I'm actually not sure if there was an earlier version, but 1789 it contained a pattern for stays, albeit a slightly less structured version than what we would have seen before, which also tells us that stays were continuing to be worn into the 1780s by people who weren't even at the top of fashion society. With my Becoming Felicity project, it was pretty much guaranteed that I was going to have to make some kind of historical undergarments, and our girl Felicity, being the child of a wealthy shop owner in 1770s Williamsburg, Virginia, she's going to be wearing stays. In Meet Felicity, we get a brief glimpse of 18th century fashion when Felicity is complaining about her stays being too tight. Now, I realize I just complained about people with this myth of tight lacing in the 18th century, but that's not what's happening here. Felicity's complaining that her stays are pinching and her mother's like, stop slouching. That's a thing. If you slouch in your stays, they're going to pinch you. They are literally designed to make you not do that. Children's stays are designed to fit snugly, but they are not designed to reduce the waist measurement at all. So, what sort of stays to make? If we look at the stays Felicity's paper doll is wearing, and then again at the version that American Girl made for the 18-inch doll, it looks like Felicity has a pretty basic style, which was common around 1760 to maybe 1770. They're fully boned and made of, well, this is cotton muslin, but let's pretend this is wool or linen, shall we? Of the excellent stays I've ever seen, Felicity's are most reminiscent to me of these baby stays from the Philadelphia Museum of Art. That said, these yellow cotton and linen stays, as well as these green wool and linen stays, are a little bit closer to what I think Felicity would have actually had. They are both held in the collection of Colonial Williamsburg. By the way, thank you Neil for letting me share them. And I've linked them down below so you all can have a closer look as well. 
I am extremely tempted to recreate these absolutely exquisite silk stays. They're from 1775, which is perfect for our project. You can see that they're a little bit lighter and more delicate than the three I just showed you. Unfortunately, they're a bit too fancy for Felicity. Maybe later. Conveniently, I just published my children's stays pattern a few months ago, and that's what I'm going to use here. Honestly, it would be weird if I didn't, right, <laughs> since I literally just drafted it on my daughter and it currently fits like a glove, so that bit is done. Anyway, the Elizabeth stays are designed to work for styles between 1750 and 1780, or even later if you want to play with boning layouts. I'm going to make view A, which is actually based on some stays in a private collection, but looks a lot like the ones we just saw. Although I want these to be as accurate as possible, I was out of linen buckram when I made them, so the structural layer will be a natural cotton canvas instead. The exterior is a gorgeous cream linen ticking from Berlin Trowbridge. My daughter calls these her vanilla ice cream stays, which, fine, I'll take it. I have a secret to tell you. Making stays isn't really difficult. Drafting them, yes. Fitting them, absolutely. Making them, not really, it's just time consuming. Because they have so many layers, you have to baste all the pieces together, similar to flatlining, before you can do anything else. And that's just the beginning. Transferring the boning channels is my absolute least favorite part of stay making. I hate it more than eyelets. I hate it more than binding around sharp curves. Not a fan. If I had fewer arguments about tendonitis with my wrist, then I would be backstitching these channels by hand. But here we are. The machine is faster and significantly less painful. As usual, I used my magic friction pens to make the lines disappear, but one of the coolest things, in my opinion, about surviving garments is just how many of them still have centuries-old pencil lines on them. With all of the pieces basted, the boning channels stitched, and seam allowances pressed and stitched down, the next step is whip stitching the pieces together. For this, you want to use a doubled or quadrupled, heavily waxed, strong linen thread. It's a little bit tedious, and it seems like it's not going to work until you do it, but it's so satisfying in the end. It's not absolutely required, but it's really nice when you take the seams that have been whipped and then cover them with a linen tape later on. Before inserting bones, I like to add the eyelets. It's kind of a pain to stitch them with bones in the way, so whether or not this is accurate, I honestly don't care. Why didn't I film eyelets, you ask? Well, two reasons. Number one, I'm planning to do some short, in-depth tutorials for the finer points of stay making to go along with my pattern, so check back later for tips on boning and eyelets and binding and lining and all of that. Number two, every time I tried to film stitching an eyelet, I thread tangled. Annoying. For now, I'm pretty happy with how these turned out. I bound them with the same fabric as the front of the stays and eventually managed to keep my thread untangled long enough to put in eyelets. My daughter absolutely loves these so-called ice cream stays, and you'll get to see more of them when we do the full Neat Felicity outfit. But she's still a modern kid who wants to move around as much as possible, so I went ahead and made her another pair. The green linen stays are half-boned and apparently feel like a warm hug. These she's happy to wear 24-7. As you can see, my daughter is very uncomfortable and is being repressed by the patriarchy. I hope you enjoyed this brief overview of 18th century children's days. I could honestly talk about this topic forever, so making this concise was a struggle. A bunch of my sources are linked down below if you want to research this topic on your own or check my facts. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe if you feel like it, and I'll see you again soon. Bye. Um, hi. Uh, I was today years old when I realized that the Felicity stays that Pleasant Company slash Now American Girl used to make are hand finished. Where has the quality gone? Look at these. What is this? No. I'm gonna get back to work. Are you in pain? No. Are the stays hurting you? No. Can you breathe?
course I do. 